Have you ever wondered what turning a concept in your head into a functional reality with a 3D printer looks like? Well, in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly what that process looks like by showing you a real example. I think it's safe to say there's a lot of curiosity out there about 3D printing. Maybe just learning what the heck it is and how it works, or it could be how to apply it to solve real world problems. Now I've seen firsthand how 3D printing can solve huge scale problems when I was an applications engineer working for a major 3D printing brand. And in this video, I'll leverage some of that knowledge and my own experience to show you the complete process from art to part. Now I'm in the process of setting up a new aquarium in our house and I've run across a couple of modifications that I think a 3D printer is perfectly suited to help me solve. And the first thing is how the light is mounted. Now the actual brackets for this light were actually designed for a different type of top. So they really don't fit with the type of top we have on there. So I'd like to create a replacement for this so that it's much more secure and actually helps support the tank lid. And the second thing I wanna modify is how the tank lid actually attaches to the tank itself. You can see it uses these little flimsy plastic clips and this tank lid is actually thin glass. So I really just wanna make a more secure secure way that it sits on top of the tank. But I also want it to be able to slide back and forth so I can open it, feed the fish, close it back. So those are the two problems we're looking to solve today using my 3D printer. So let's back up just a bit. I think it's important to understand the macro limitations of 3D printing right off the bat. And what I mean is oftentimes the physical part size itself may disqualify it from being a good 3D printing candidate right from the get go. Now most hobby 3D printers have a work envelope of about eight inches cubed. So ideally your part should fit within that box. Now there are ways to create assemblies by printing out multiple parts that makes a larger part, but that is probably a little advanced for this video. So to keep things simple, at least when you're starting out, try to limit the part size to the printer's envelope. And the second consideration are the material properties. Will this part be holding hundreds of pounds of force? Will someone's safety or life be dependent on this part? Will it be exposed to high temperatures? Most hobby grade 3D printing materials just aren't great at high strength or high temperature applications. Again, unless you have some advanced knowledge in which you can apply to account for that. So I would limit 3D printed part applications, at least in the beginning, to something with a low strength requirement and a low overall risk. Now the aquarium parts I have in mind all fit within my printer's volume and will not be subjected to harsh conditions, so they should be great candidates to print. So what's the first step? And the first step in any design process really would be start with a simple sketch. Now I'm a big proponent of technology, we'll get into that, but there is nothing quite like old fashioned pencil and paper to start. So because the parts I wanna print are based on an existing object, like the light in the fish tank, it's important to get some basic dimensions from them. Now starting with the light itself and seeing how the existing mounts attach to the tank and to the light, I can use that to take a set of calipers and take some measurements from that and then transfer them to my sketch. Ideally, you wanna avoid reinventing the wheel when you can. I'll then take some measurements of the tank itself just to get an idea of how this thing's all gonna come together. Now once I'm happy with my sketch, I'm ready for part two and that's to create the 3D model. Yes, every single 3D print has to start from a 3D model. There's just no getting around it. Now this seems to be where some people get hung up. Huh? I have to make a 3D model? I don't know how to do that. What do I even use? And it's true, if you don't have any experience doing this, it can seem daunting. But the good news is that both learning these skills and gaining access to some high quality CAD programs are easier and cheaper than ever. Now, I'm personally a big fan of Fusion 360, which is a paid subscription, but there are other free options out there as well, like SketchUp, and Tinkercad. Now in terms of learning resources to get you up to speed, there's lots of free videos here on YouTube to teach you the basics. Or you can pay for a course such as the Product Design Online Academy. Now I'm a big fan of this one. I always point people here for some well laid out instructions on Fusion 360. It's structured in a way that teaches you the building blocks and teaches you the right skills in the right order, which is important. I'll have a link down below if you wanna go check that out. So I won't go into too much detail on how to 3D model per se. That's a topic for many other videos. But essentially all you're doing is taking a series of 2D sketches which you're creating in the computer, which references the physical sketch that you made on paper. And then we just manipulate the material around until you get the shape you want. And when you're done, you'll end up with something like this. Let's pause quickly to talk about our sponsor, Masterworks. When it comes to investing your hard earned money, there's a lot of options out there including the stock market. But with inflation at a near 40 year high and the market going absolutely nuts right now, it feels a little bit more like gambling at the moment. What if there were another way to invest your money to hedge this risk? Well, that's where Masterworks comes in, a complete platform for investing in art. Yeah, art. Masterworks is the first platform for buying and selling shares, representing an investment in iconic works of art. You see, it turns out that two thirds of billionaire collectors allocate between 10 and 30% of their overall portfolio to art. So I figure billionaires are doing it, there's probably something to it. In fact, contemporary art has outpaced the S&P 500 total return by 174% from 1999 to 2020, according to publicly available data. 
Simply put, you can now invest in the same art that the billionaires do, by names like Banksy, Monet, Basquiat, and other iconic artists for just a fraction of what they would pay to purchase. Now, one of the best parts about investing with Masterworks is they really know what they're doing when it comes to selling art. They recently returned 32% to their investors in 2020 by selling a works by Banksy. And there's also a secondary market so you can buy and sell shares with other investors, similar to how you would sell stock on an app like Robinhood. Now, if you want to take advantage and invest in some fine art, there is a waiting list. But you can skip that wait list and immediately start investing by clicking my link in the video description. And it also really supports the channel. So go on, go check it out. Step three is exporting your 3D model into a special file type called an STL. Now STL stands for Standard Tessellation Language. What is this, Star Trek? Which is basically a unitless mesh body made up of tons of tiny triangles. Now you don't really need to know any of those details other than to understand that there is a range of resolution in that file type. The lower the resolution, the bigger the triangle size, thus the blockier the appearance. The finer the resolution, the smaller the triangle size, and the more smooth the surface and thus your print will be at the end. Now in general, you wanna go for as fine a resolution as you can without making a huge file size, which in most cases is not really a concern. And then once you're done, export that to your slicing software. Now I know what you're thinking, Slicer? I barely know her. <laughs> no, slicing software is a program that takes the STL file that you exported from your 3D model and then slices it into hundreds or thousands of layers that are each then stacked on top of each other and creates a file with a set of instructions that your printer can read. I know, stay with me. There's a lot of steps here, right? Well, if you think about it, your printer's kind of just a dumb robot. You have to tell it exactly what to do, what kind of material you're using, how fast or slow you want it to print, how rough or smooth you want the part to be, and even how dense the part is. Once you give it those details, your slicing software will create a file which contains G-code with all of the instructions laid out in a language that the printer can read. And this is what you finally need to start your print. The next step is to power up your printer, load the correct material, and upload your newly minted print file containing the G-code we talked about earlier. Now some 3D printers can read the files directly from something like an SD card or a USB stick, while others can transfer over the internet via either a wired or wireless connection. And once the file is on the 3D printer, you simply click print and then bam, it's done. Instant, amazing technology. Just comes right out of the printer. At least I wish it was that easy. You see, especially when you're designing something that has to interact with an existing fixed object, you may have to go through some design iterations to get that fit just right. But one trick that I like to use is called unit testing. Instead of printing out your entire part every time just to check the fit in one or a couple areas, just print out the small part that's actually interacting with the object itself. This is pretty easy to do in your 3D model and will save you a ton of time and filament as you're trying to chase that perfect fit. And once I'm happy with the fit and the design, I'm ready to print the final part. When it's done, I simply remove it from the print bed. Now the printers that I prefer have a flexible metal print bed, so you just kind of bend them back and forth, which eventually pops the part right off the bed. Some other styles may include a flat glass bed, which you have to scrape the part off. Either way, they come off relatively easy. And it's at this time that for some parts, you'll have to remove some support material, which does just as the name implies. It actually supports your model during the printing process. And there's different styles. There's breakaway, there's dissolvable. Now in my design, I elected to go for no supports, which by the way is totally ideal for 3D printing. But in some cases, you just can't avoid it. So this would be the place where you remove those. And again, the topic of designing your parts such that you don't need support material is a whole video in and of itself. All right, so let's take our newly printed parts and go put them on the aquarium. There we go. This is so much better. Everything seems to fit really nice and the fit and finish of these parts looks really good on this aquarium. In fact, you can't even really tell they're 3D printed until you get really close. And should I need to alter or change this in the future? It's just a matter of updating the 3D model and then reprinting. I know it might seem like a small improvement, but having a tool like a 3D printer to quickly solve this problem is hugely helpful, not only in and around your house, but in your shop. And it may have also looked like a lot of work, but in reality, this was about an hour's worth of my time. And when you're getting started, it might take a little bit longer, but the more you do it, the more efficient you'll become.
And by the way, if you're just getting started with 3D printing, you can circumvent the whole 3D model thing by just downloading existing models from a place like Thingiverse. This is a free website where people go and upload models that they've made. Most of them are designed specifically for 3D printing. So you can spend that time really getting to know your machine and learning more about the printing process. So in summary, step zero should be the question, should I even print this? Does it make sense to print from a size and material standpoint? Then step one should be a physical sketch where you reference any parts that you'll be interacting with. And then step two is the 3D model. Remember to create unit testing if you're not sure about fit so that you don't waste time and filament reprinting the part over and over again. Step three would be slicing the part in your slicer software, which creates a form of digital instruction for your printer to read. And then step four would be, of course, printing the final part. That's it. I hope this was helpful if you're generally curious of the workflow of going from concept to reality with a 3D printer. In my opinion, it's a great hobby, but it's an even better tool to supplement your shop. I've printed countless things around my shop, and I even run a small print farm dedicated to just printing products for other people's shops. I'll link some great resources down in the video description below if you want to dive a little deeper on any of those topics. Thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear what you thought about this video down in the comments below. Did this answer many of your questions, or did it create twice as many new ones? If you've watched the channel for any length of time, you know that I love 3D printing. I just want to make sure that there's actually interest out there in learning more about this topic. If you haven't already, smash the like button. If you're not already subscribed, please do that. I will catch you guys in the next project. And until then, keep pursuing shop greatness.